Chapter 10 Real Rate of Return For my first decade at Morgan Stanley and Company, I was a true believer. Whatever the firm told me to do, I did it. Whatever the firm said to believe, I believed in earnest. And when Morgan Stanley gave me a list of mutual funds and ETFs to sell, I sold them. Only after an uncomfortable visit to the doctor did I learn that serving my firm's desires had distracted me from a more important consideration. What did my clients actually need? By the early 90s, I had shown an adeptness for selling financial advice. Empathy for the client was a strong suit of mine, I felt, as was my willingness to bluntly point out the failings of rival firms. My faith in Morgan Stanley's products didn't hurt, either. On one sales sweep into Tulsa, Oklahoma, I set up shop in a hotel near the airport and started cold-calling new prospects in the area. In those days, what you coveted most of all was a print directory of a big company's employees, all of them potential clients. On this trip, I was fortunate to have a directory of Phillips Petroleum, and I picked up the phone in my hotel room and began calling company executives one by one. This was how I came across Dr. Gene Whitner. I rented a car and drove an hour and a half from Tulsa to Bartlesville, Oklahoma, to pitch him my services. He led me into his modest home and led me down the hallway, past the living room, and into the kitchen, where we sat at the kitchen table, and I began my spiel. I laid out brochures of various mutual funds and began describing them, when Dr. Whitner interrupted me and asked, Son, what do I need? I don't know, I answered without hesitation. I knew only what I could sell him. That's right, he said, because you never asked. If you don't have the wherewithal to ask what I need, how can you help me? He then politely asked me to leave and ushered me out. Only later did I learn that he was retiring on four million dollars. He was a widower with no children, and he needed only four hundred dollars a month to cover his living expenses. Those facts changed the picture dramatically, yet most financial planners proceeded like I had, without answering that most basic question, what does the client need? Lesson learned. Ultimately, I landed Dr. Whitner as a client, parking some of his money in managed futures as a hedge against the main investments in his portfolio. At the most respected firms on Wall Street, they would have you believe that the focus is on serving your individual needs, when often the firm's upside is just as important a consideration. They sell you their products because they make more money on them. When a Wall Street Goliath conjures up a new investment fund, say, or a new senior note with guaranteed annual returns, it wants to peddle this to investors to reap upfront fees that will then recur every year. Senior management at headquarters passes out an allocation of the new product to the regional directors and chiefs, who push the wares to their 30 to 40 branch managers. Each manager then puts the touch on his 20 or 30 financial advisors. How much of this can you handle for us? Zero is an unacceptable answer. Try again. An old broker friend of mine refers to this as the clipboard the boss of the office going from rep to rep and keeping a tally of who was signing on to sell how much of the new product, without a microsecond of attention paid to asking, does this fit my client's needs? The biggest producers could win an all-expenses-paid trip to the Bahamas on a luxury cruise ship or land a special bonus for selling their firm's newest investment scheme, an upside that usually was kept secret from their clients. Other times, we brokers had to be willing to sell our clients new shares in a dull secondary offering of stock in a particular company as a quid pro quo for the brokers getting access later to the hottest new stocks just going public. All too often, serving ourselves rather than our clients was the real driver. I recall one day when, just as the market closed, we Morgan brokers received instructions to sell out a 100,000 shares of a secondary stock offering for something called Plum Creek Timber. That night, 
And though we knew nothing about the company or why its shares might be suitable for our clients, we sure as hell did sell it to them. Never mind whether the stock did well. Clients would think that we had a master plan for their portfolios and that Morgan Stanley had just alerted us to an urgent buy they must add to their holdings. In reality, our urgency and what we are shilling for often have more to do with the firm's agenda than with the client's considerations. It always has been this way, and most investors are unaware of it. It is time to wake up and realize that practices like this go on all the time in the financial advice business. These practices go undetected by clients because investors are so intently focused on one thing, how much money their portfolio can earn in returns. They monitor how much is coming in at the front end and neglect to pay attention to how much money is going out in the process, how much is being lost to drains such as taxes and fees and commissions that are the true goal of Wall Street. Exorbitant spending is one big drain, and if your increase in the cost of living is eclipsing your investment returns, you may want to fix your portfolio and move to a cheaper place to live. The combination of the two moves could save you from financial strain or even ruin. Another kind of drain is more insidious. It creeps up on you sight unseen and takes such a skinny sliver of your returns that you barely notice it or don't care if you do. Yet this sliver can compound, adding up to a significant drag on your results over a few decades. I'm talking about the slow, silent scourge of inflation and the real price increases in your cost of living. Your personal inflation rate likely is bigger than the government CPI says it is, and that undercuts the returns in your account. Taxes also are a big drain on the returns of a portfolio outside your retirement account. Other gremlins in the system also take their cut. Management fees, investment fees, and administrative expenses. Fix a few flaws here, and you can save thousands of dollars over a period of 30 years, or maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars if your account is at seven figures or more. Only after determining what your portfolio is losing to these forces can you know how your account truly is faring, bottom line. In a previous chapter, all of the discussion of standard deviation and how it was derived from 10 years of real results involved the gross rate of return. This is how much your investments earned before you had to pay certain costs of the investing, before deducting fees, expenses, and taxes. Once you have revved down your account's standard deviation as much as possible while ensuring adequate returns, you then can focus on whittling down fees and expenses, too. Start with a simple assumption that if your investments began the year with a total value of $100,000 and ended at $115,000, you made a 15% return. The more complicated answer, and keep in mind that on Wall Street, complicated matters drive more fees for advice and strategies on how to handle them, is that your gross return was 15%, but that is just for starters. The real question is what your real rate of return after you lost invisible slivers of your assets to inflation, taxes, and fees. Often we invest in a mutual fund or ETF while paying scant attention to whether there was a starting fee, a load in mutual fund parlance, to buy it, and with little idea of whether the annual fees we pay amount to 1% of our investment or just 0.1% per year. Yet the difference between those two numbers is enormous, and compounded over four decades, from your 20s to your 60s, the money you save or squander can add up to hundreds of thousands of dollars. The little stuff counts, and always remember the best way to get rich is to hold on to what you already have, rather than making huge, risky bets on something that might pay off big time. Cut your expenses and spending, save and invest more, and accept consistent, middling returns to reduce your risk and protect against big losses. It is like good barbecue and smoking techniques, 
low and slow and steady until it's ready. And now I shall cease and desist with the cooking metaphors as they make me hungry. You want to be able to maintain your current standard of living for the rest of your life, right? You want to avoid being forced to settle for less, possibly a lot less, because your investments fell behind the increase in your cost of living each year. My goal is to make sure investors know exactly how much money they need to maintain their purchasing power from today until they die. This level of directness is rare on Wall Street, where things are intentionally obtuse, cloaked in camouflage, so that advisors can speak in generalities without getting tied down to the details. I say let us cut to the chase. How much better is your life after taxes, after fees, after the increase in your cost of living? Has your financial advisor helped make your life better? The big Wall Street firms never tell you that. People need to know their real rate of return. It is time for them to get real. The problem is that neither brokers nor money managers have any idea what real rate of return is or how to construct a portfolio to achieve a better one. So, let's break it down. Real Rate of Return A rate of return is the amount of money you gain or lose on an investment in a set period of time, expressed as a percentage of the investment's cost. So, if you invest $1,000 in a stock and you sell it for $1,100, you have a rate of return of 10%. This is where most investors stop asking questions and where most wealth managers want them to stop asking questions. All rate of return tells you is how much you made on your investment at first glance. It stops short of telling you anything about how much risk you took to make that money or the expenses and other costs involved. Deduct those, and you have your real rate of return. For now, remember this formula. Real rate of return equals gross rate of return minus management fees, taxes, and cost of living increase. Real rate of return is the metric to watch in calculating whether your investments are spinning off enough gains and dividends each year to protect you from losing ground to the rising prices in your part of the world. It answers the question, what do I have left? After taxes and fees and the like, are you still ahead and building wealth, or are you falling behind? That's where my chip score comes in. It will help you figure out what real rate of return is adequate to protect your purchasing power. The process begins by investing for gross return, usually by investing in one or more of three areas, an income-producing security, a security geared more toward capital growth, the rising price of the investment, or an alternative vehicle. Income investments come with some form of assurance you will get the money you invested returned to you at some point. Somebody or some company promises to pay you back, therefore the risk is lower which means you must settle for a lower return. These investments involve some form of borrowing. They are loans of some kind. So the amount you originally invested is not going to grow. You will get that same amount back at some point, collecting some kind of return on your loan as interest or dividends or distributions. For example, you might loan money to a friend and have a promissory note as the promise to repay. In exchange for this loan, your friend pays you interest. A bank might loan money to you to buy a house, which of course is called a mortgage. In exchange for this loan, you promise to repay the bank over 30 years, and in the meantime pay it interest for taking on the risk of handing you the loan. The city where you live might issue municipal bonds that investors from all over the world can buy, which transfers their money to your city allowing it to be used for a specific purpose. The city promises to repay the bondholders in several years, along with interest each year, as compensation for taking on the risk of loaning money to the city. Growth investments come in many forms, but usually involve actual ownership of something, such as a small piece of a company, otherwise known as shares of stock. 
It could be real estate. It could be shares in a mutual fund. With growth, you have unlimited upside. You might invest in a restaurant business that specializes in cheesecake. Twenty years later, this restaurant becomes a chain called the Cheesecake Factory because it kept growing and growing. Now the piece of that company you purchased is worth much more than it was originally. Then again, you could lose your entire investment. Maybe you invested in an electronics chain called Circuit City, which fell to intense competition from Best Buy on one front, brick and mortar, and Amazon.com on another, online. It disappeared, and its stock went to zero, and your investment ended up being worth nothing. While a stock's price is supposed to offer enough growth to compensate holders for the higher risk they take on by buying it, once a company stumbles and bankruptcy looms, it plunges, often declining well before anyone knew the company was in trouble. The third category of investments, alternatives, includes private equity, hedge fund strategies, and venture capital investments. It is best to mix and match investments from all three buckets, income, growth, alternative, and figure out the best proportions to serve your realistic target for returns, given your appetite for risk or your aversion to it. Why mix investments? Because you want to avoid tying yourself down to just one type of investment. If you are all in on stocks and the market crashes, but bonds hold up, and alternatives do well in the same period, you will have put all your eggs in the worst basket. By diversifying, you put some money into each kind of investment to protect yourself, because each one has a different level of risk. You can't totally decide this allocation until, one, you figure out the best mix based on historical performance and an assessment of where things are headed, and two, you factor in your expenses and taxes. A realistic expectation for real rate of return is about 10% annually when investing in public securities. That has been the average, roughly speaking, since 2000. That is a reasonable benchmark to set as your target. So now we know that we want to have three categories of investment so you can earn a gross rate of return. But how much of each kind of investment do we want in our portfolio? All investors invariably will say they want to earn the most money or get the highest gross return possible with the least amount of risk. That's great, but how do you actually get there? Everybody thinks brokers have some special sauce or magic ability to do it, and that if you are nice to them, they will let you in on the big secret. There is no big secret. This is where we get back to the importance of real rate of return. My chip score will help you figure out what it needs to be to hold on to your purchasing power. Using the chip score and based on history, you can figure out what percentage of a portfolio should be dedicated to growth versus income versus alternatives. Management Fees and Taxes Now we're going to look at the expenses that deduct from gross rate of return. Management fees and taxes are two of the three main expenses you subtract from gross rate of return to find the real rate of return. Management fees are the amount you pay your money manager or registered investment advisor to manage your portfolio. In the early days, management fees were 2% of total assets managed. Today, they are down to 0.25% to 0.5%. There's another type of management fee. Most portfolio managers will invest part of your money in a fund managed by a third party. And for this apparent honor, you must pay a sub-advised fund. The fees on these funds can vary widely. A hot-handed hedge fund manager may charge 2% of the total assets placed with him, plus 20% of any profit the fund generates. Other funds are targeted to invest in only certain kinds of stocks, such as small-cap value or large-cap growth, and their fees hover around 0.01% to 1.5%. Again, while the difference between those two numbers looks minuscule, in fact it is significant. 
especially when compounded over twenty or thirty or forty years. Obviously, you want low fees, but you also want the best managed fund, as far as meeting your desire for a certain real rate of return and one that reflects your risk profile. Always ask your manager to specify what fees he charges and what fees any sub-advisors charge. No fee ever should be higher than 1%, except certain hedge funds and private equity funds, many of which had cut their fees in half after the meltdown of 2008 and have raised fees steadily back up toward their previous highs. Taxes take an even bigger bite out of your investment gains than management fees. We all hate taxes, and one of the challenges of structuring any portfolio is making certain it is tax-efficient for each individual investor. If there's a lot of buying and selling in your portfolio, your broker is running up trading commission fees and may be generating a ton of capital gains on which you will have to pay taxes. If you're in a high tax bracket, even a good gross rate of return can be eaten away by taxes. At first glance, you might turn to tax-free bonds to sidestep the tax burden, yet a taxable bond of a lower investment grade can pay an interest rate much higher than the tax-free bond. If you lose 40% of your earnings to taxes, you would require a taxable bond paying 3.33% to match the tax-free returns of a 2% tax-free bond. This is one reason that investing inside your retirement account is paramount, allowing your principal to grow tax-free for decades and then compounding on top of that ever larger sum, making you richer and richer. The problem is that the government imposes limits on how much of your earnings you are allowed to tuck away, untouched for years to come. You have educated yourself in alternative assets to balance out stock holdings, non-correlated assets, arbitrage strategies, and bonds. And you have learned to discount COLA, taxes, and fees to sift out your portfolio's real rate of return. Now you are ready to take on a mission-critical skill in investing, asset allocation, up next in Chapter 11.